guys, this is Kristen Tate with Young Americans for Liberty. You're listening to our new podcast, You Built That. This week we have a very special guest. We have Joel Baumgar. He is a state representative in the Mississippi House of Representatives, and he's also founder of Baumgar Corporation. He also does a bunch of other stuff. Uh, he is a very impressive individual. Joel, we are very, very honored to have you. Thanks for joining. You built that. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. So I want to talk about your, you know, time in politics as well. But first, I just want to ask you, you know, what did Baumgar Corporation do for the 11 years that you, know, you served as founder, CEO and chairman and you really built that business? What did it do and how did you get that company started? Thank you. Yeah, so I built a company, Baumgar Corporation, right out of college. I was a computer IT technical support engineer. And at the time, there was not good technology to fix computer problems over the Internet. And so I built that. So I, I built the very first uh, sort of version of the, what became our product, which at the time did a bunch of stuff that other products in the market did not do and turned out to be very successful and it grew. And uh, by, the, by the time I sold the company 11 years later, I started it essentially my senior year of college and sold the company 11 years later. On the day we sold, we had about uh, 220 employees and about 57 million in annual revenue. And uh, I had at that point accomplished everything I set out to do. And we were number one in the world for the enterprise remote support market, which was the, the niche of IT remote support technology, screen sharing technology that the, the, the niche we were in, we had become number one in market share worldwide. So uh, that's what we did. Incredible. So what was that like building a business at such a young age? Because that's pretty unusual, especially, you know, the the building of a business that actually survives and thrives. So how did you actually start this business at such a young age without, you know, decades of experience and capital? Well, I think in some ways, uh, the, the ignorance of starting out is a blessing because like most things, if you st if you realized how hard the climb would be before you started the climb, you may not start the climb. I mean, entrepreneurship is incredibly rewarding, inc incredibly lucrative, but it's a ton of hard work. And, and what separates a good versus a bad entrepreneur is not just the idea, it's diligence, perseverance, work ethic. It's the, the only sort of character trait that really the only trait at all that is correlated with, with successful entrepreneur, entrepreneurship is determination. Mm -hmm. And so in my case, did I know what I was doing? No, but I knew that everything that was worth knowing was written down in a book somewhere or in someone's head. And if I talked to enough people and if I read enough books, articles, research papers, I could figure out what I needed to know to build the business. And ultimately I did. I, I figured that out. I partnered with you know, fellow, uh, you know, graduates that graduated from Bellhaven University with me. And we figured it out. And no matter how many hurdles we hit, we, we ultimately overcame each of them. And part of that was hard work and intellect and all of that. Part of that was God's blessing of God blessing our efforts. And all, although in retrospect with 11 years, it looks easy, you, you know, we just did that. Um, the truth is, uh, you know, there's lots of ups and downs that mm -hmm. lead to an ultimate success like that. And, and what got it through all of those ups and downs was a lot of due diligence, a lot of reading, a lot of research, a lot of talking to people who had done it before. And ultimately, the, the never ending perseverance that we will not stop until the world has a better remote support product than it does today. And we, did, we built that. We built that into the best remote support platform in the world. And still today, six years later after I sold the company, the Baumgar platform for remote support is still the number one platform, the most sophisticated and robust remote support platform in the world used by many or even most of the world's largest companies. It's an incredibly inspiring story. You know, we talk to a lot of CEOs and entrepreneurs here at Young Americans for Liberty, and most of them say that, you know, while they were working in the field in their respective industries, they noticed a gap in the market and a need in the market. So given that you started this company right, you know, at, at the end of your college career, how did you identify that need in the market without actually working in the industry first? So good question. So I was working part time doing computer technical support for people, people's computers. And so I had this, I was born in 1980 and I had this 1979 Buick LeSabre I was driving around that cost me $500. <laughs> so the car was, 
older than I was and cost $500. And I got sick of driving it around. I was fixing all these computer problems where I thought, well, the only problem is I can't see the computer on the other end. I can't move the mouse. I can't type on the keyboard. And unless the computer has smoke coming out of it, which most of the time they don't, that means you're solving a software problem. And so the question I had was, well, why do I always have to physically be there? Now, today, there are numerous remote support technologies. Everybody expects computers to be problems to be solved remotely. But back when I started Bongar Corporation, that was not the case. The vast majority of computer problems were solved in person on site. And so as I was doing that on breaks and on Christmas vacation, driving all over the state of Mississippi, fixing people's computer problems, that was the idea I had, which was there's, there must be a better way. Why can't I sit at my desk and fix one or two or three computers all, all at the same time? Mm. Ultimately, I built the first version of the software for myself. And then once I had it for myself, I thought there's no way I'm not the, you know, I can't be the only tech support in the world that needs this software. And so I built the company to sell it to everyone else. So I, I switched from doing computer technical support to building a software product for myself to selling that software product to everybody else like me. And at that point, I was not doing anybody's tech support anymore. I was entirely focused on building the product and the platform that enabled people like who I used to be. But I understand the, I understood the market and the need and the pain because the first customer was me. And then obviously I discovered that there were, you know, millions of other people that were experiencing the same pain that had the same appetite and thousands or millions of dollars that they were willing to spend uh, on that product. Wow. So, so when you sold the company in 2014, you had over 200 employees and $60 million in annual revenues. When you started Baumgar Corporation, did you ever envision it getting that big? I mean, did you really set your sights big and, and think that it would blow up that much? Or was it sort of a surprise to you? So good question. So the, the, uh, one of my very early partners in this in, uh, endeavor I remember specifically telling them after I had sold the first few licenses, I'd made, you know, a couple thousand dollars. I remember telling them with excitement in my voice that I think we can make a couple hundred thousand dollars off of it. <laughs> and I had just graduated from college. I had about 20 or something thousand dollars in student loans, maybe $30,000 in student loans. And I'm thinking, wow, a couple hundred grand, we could split the money among us. And I'm going to have enough to pay down college loans plus some, and that's going to be great. And so not only did we make a couple hundred thousand dollars before we sold the company, we had made a couple hundred million dollars selling the software into 65 countries around the world to more than 10,000 different companies and organizations that ultimately purchased our software. Unbelievable. So, you know, your time as a businessman probably taught you a lot. Um, what do you think, if you had to pinpoint, say, three, four, or five qualities that make a successful entrepreneur, what would you say those qualities would be? Sure. I would say number one is determination. If, if, if you do not have a history of going through walls to accomplish whatever your visions and dreams are, you're not going to make it because there is no company that is easy to start. They're all hard. Every successful company looks easy in retrospect. It looks like they just put a few things together and like magic happened. If you actually go study the startup of any startup company, it is very, very difficult. And it requires the determination that you have a dream and you will not let that dream go. The world, you cannot sleep at night because the world has to have some product or service it doesn't have today. And you will just not let it go until you have made the world a better place. So I think the number one is the character trait of determination. Uh, you have to have teachability. I mean, if you're not somebody that listens or not somebody that learns, then you're going to make a lot of mistakes yourself that you don't need to. You could have found out through other people's mistakes. There's no reason to make mistakes yourself that other people have made before you that you can learn from them and avoid those mistakes yourself. And so I think you have to have that intellectual curiosity, the willingness to learn and to adapt. Uh, but I think it, it all goes back to determination. And then I would say, you know, if you're interested in starting something, go read the book, The Art of the Start 2.0 by Guy Kawasaki. So that book, The Art of the Start 2.0 by, by Guy Kawasaki, is the best startup book I've ever read hmm. about the mindset, the concept, and how you need to start an entrepreneurial endeavor. Uh, it's focused, of course, on business and entrepreneurial endeavors. 
but it, it really applies to starting anything. Um, so I, I would I would start with that book plus determination and a willingness to learn. And you can you know you humans are incredible. We can figure just about anything out if we have the determination to keep at it long enough. Definitely. I think, you know, you're describing a lot uh, of, of words that, that remind me of the word grit to just this, this hunger and this passion to succeed. Um, so, so you obviously started your company quite young. Did you use any of the skills you learned in college? Or do you think, um, you know, in terms of running a company that what kids are learning today in these institutions is largely irrelevant? <laughs> <laughs> like most things, it's a mix, right? Yeah, so yeah most a lot of what you learn is not applicable but some of what you learn in college gives you the confidence level to go figure out where the gaps are and what you need to know so i had a business degree from college but you know it's a i was going to ask I is mean, that what you studied did you study business or i did but see the problem is most people one most bu most business degrees do not focus on entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and the ones that do are typically taught by pe by people who have not actually been an entrepreneur and so a textbook on entrepreneurship <laughs> like i would rather take guy kawasaki's book the art of the start 2.0 that's better than probably 10 books on entrepreneurship written by people that haven't actually done it and and i think that especially when you're trying to build something it is 10 times as valuable to talk to someone who has actually done it as to try to learn from someone who studied it but never done it before it's just different and, and i'm always very clear with people when they ask my opinion on things i always try to delineate whether i am offering them a free opinion based on my experience or a free opinion based on my opinion and, so, <laughs> and, and i'm always clear that look look you know now we're moving you know i'll say you know halfway through a conversation Everything I've told you so far is based on my own experience and therefore highly likely to be relevant and credible. What I'm about to say, whatever it is they ask me, what I'm about to say is an opinion I have, but it is not based in my experience. Therefore, it is mostly worthless, but it's, I still have it. And so, but I think it's important to understand that when you're learning academics, a lot of what you're learning is you're learning from people who have not done it that have mm -hmm. an opinion. Mm -hmm. and. You know, opinions are just not that valuable if they're not coming from people who know what they're talking about. And in any industry, it's not specific to entrepreneurship, but in any industry, trying to learn from somebody, trying to learn about how to be a state representative from somebody who studied it and never done it, who's never experienced those pressures, who's never been inside a Republican caucus meeting closed door, like trying to learn it from somebody who studied it is just totally different from talking to someone who's been there and lived that and saying, what is it like? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think no matter what you're studying, I think you should try to learn it from someone who's done it. And uh, entrepreneurship is no different. So you've also been very open about the fact that you conduct business in accordance with your Christian faith. So I would love to hear a little bit about that uh, because it's very, you know, it's becoming increasingly rare today to, to encounter people like that who, who do lead with their faith, especially in business. So can you kind of tell me a little bit about that and how the reception from your customer base was to your Christian values? So we were very explicit, myself and, and my very first two employees who were uh, co-founders, they came on in the first few months of the business, are all Christians. And we were very explicit. We, we explicitly said our vision is to honor God by applying biblical principles in relation to our employees, customers, and financial dealings. I mean, that was on the website. That was etched on the wall. So, I mean, like you could not buy our product. And our product was being bought by very large, very secular organizations, including in some very not friendly to Christianity hmm. countries, but they were buying our product because it was the best and it was the best. And, and with 200 employees, we had people of all faiths. We had people of no faiths. We had the entire gamut. And so what we said is these are our principles and these are based in biblical principles, but here is the core values that everyone has to live by regardless of what you believe. So whether or not you're a Christian, we expect you to operate with integrity and with humility. And so, so we laid out the core values and said, every employee, regardless of your belief system, has to live by these principles. Now we believe they're based in biblical principles. If you want to believe they're based in something else, well, that's up to you. But mm -hmm, we believe mm -hmm. they're based in biblical principles. And we believe that businesses operate best when they operate consistent with the principles of the way God made the world. And I, the same would be true in government. Government operates best when it operates within the principles 
of human behavior <laughs> and uh, political economy and things like that. And so if you try to make something work that's not consistent with the way God made humans to operate or God made the world to operate, it's not going to work well. So that served us well for you know, 11 years that I ran the company. We were very public about our faith. And we got an incredibly positive reception from our customer base. So every year we'd send 10,000 Christmas cards and maybe four of them would come back with somebody offended that we had used the word Christmas. And, and we'd look back That's at them and we'd say, look, when you send 10,000 Christmas cards and you get offended by four, you know, you offend four people, well, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> we're going to keep sending them. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so that was our philosophy. And, it, and not only by Christians, but we live in a world where nobody stands for anything. I know. So I... when you put that stake in the ground and whether you're standing in business for your Christian values or whether you're standing in politics for the principles of liberty and freedom, the world craves people with conviction. Mm -hmm. And they were just, they were happy to see that we were a company with deep conviction. And that deep conviction played out in the way we built our software. It played out in the belief systems that we used interacting with the world. And every employee in, that worked at Bombgar understood that we were a company that operated on deep conviction and that was gonna permeate what we do. And, and that's, I carried that into politics as well. Yeah, I think there's definitely a lack of conviction and frankly, morals and values in many aspects of uh, everything in our country today, certainly corporate America. Um, so you've had many successes, obviously, but of course we learn more from our mistakes and our failures often than our successes. So I would love to hear about a time that you tried and you failed and what you learned from that. Sure, so I've tried to keep my failures to a minimum uh, and, and part of that is, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who have said, you know, they've learned by the school of hard knocks. And my philosophy has always been, don't learn from the school of hard knocks if you can learn from the school of someone else's hard knocks. <laughs> I and love so, that. You know, That's great. And so I was going to make a mistake. I wanted to be making a mistake because literally I could not find another human I could learn from to avoid it or I could not find a book that answered the question for me. But hmm. I would say the biggest mistake I made was diversifying too early. When you are a startup company, it's like trying to launch a rocket into space. And what a lot of people do is they take limited rocket fuel, so capital and talent is your rocket fuel. Mm -hmm. And it's very tempting as an entrepreneur with big ideas and you, know, you believe you can conquer the world to assume that you can get multiple rockets into orbit at the same time, and you can't. It is so difficult to get some product or some service into broad adoption by the world that what most, what most entrepreneurs do is they start trying to launch three rockets at the same time. And so we did that early on. A year or two into the company, we diversified and launched two other products that were unrelated to our core business. And we realized you know, within a year or two, we wasted a lot of money in the process, but we realized within a year or two that becoming number one in the world at something was far more valuable than trying to keep three things afloat. Mm -hmm. And that if we spread our limited financial capital, and in our case, we had $20 million of venture capital to work with. So even with $20 million, we realized that if we spread that among three rockets, none of those rockets was gonna reach orbit. And the nature of a rocket that does not reach orbit is that it falls back to earth and in a ball of flames, right? So, and right. so what we did is we shut down those other two products, even though, th though we had invested financial capital, time, energy, talent in those other projects, we realized we should only focus on, and, and one of my favorite books of all time, in addition to Guy Kawasaki's book, The Art of the Start 2.0, uh, Jim Collins wrote a book called Good to Great. Uh, which yes, is one we of love that book here at Yale. Yes, so Good to Great by Jim Collins is incredible, and he says, you should not be in an industry unless you are deeply passionate about it, can be the best in the world at it, and it drives your economic engine. And so we realized after we read the book, Good to Great, that the other two product lines we were, not, we were in were, did not meet those criteria. They were not things that we were deeply passionate about. They were not things that we could become the best in the world at, and they were not things that drove our economic engine. And therefore we had to shut those two products down, which is painful. Nobody likes to take something that a lot of time and energy and passion and resources have been poured into and sure. say, we're sorry, these, these rockets will never reach orbit. And so we shut those down. It was a very difficult decision, but we shut them down and it was the, the best decision we ever made. 
Um, the other the other book I'll throw out there, L. Rees, uh, spelled R I E S L A L Rees R I E S. L. Rees is is my favorite author of all time. Him and Jim Collins. And L. Rees wrote a book called Focus. And the the book Focus is incredible. And it just makes it makes a very sort of unassailable case that it's better to put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket, as the saying goes. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's just, you're just way more likely to get one rocket into space. And what people think is, well, if I diversify, then any of my rockets might make it to space. And the truth is, no, if you diversify, none of your rockets has enough rocket fuel to make it to space, which means they're all gonna fail. It is better to bank on your best rocket mm -hmm. and getting that mm -hmm. into orbit. Once you have a rocket in orbit, it doesn't require a lot of fuel anymore, right? It just goes round and round. <laughs> and so once you get a product or a service into orbit where it's generating so much cash that you can actually fund a rocket that's still back on Earth, well, yeah, then you can launch, you know, if you launch the iPod, then later you can launch the iPhone and the iPad and all these other things. But you can't, it, even Apple, even if Apple had tried to launch all of those products all together, they would have, they would struggle to have gotten all of them even as a billion, multi-billion dollar company, it would have been very difficult to launch three products at that, at that magnitude. So they did it right. They, yeah. they launched each one until each one was so successful and so profitable, they could use those excess profits to launch the next one. And most people don't understand that. And a lot of entrepreneurial endeavors fail by diversifying too early. And I would say even at 11 years in, it was still the right thing to focus on one product because yeah, it's the only way we, we became number one in the world. And once you're number one in the world, it's very easy to run a very profitable company. Yeah, I know. It's such great advice. There's another book I've read uh, that the author's name escapes me called The One Thing. It's a great book and it's about the same concept that, you know, you, you want to focus on your one passion and, and just hone in on that instead of trying to do five things and just being okay at five things. So it, I, it's I'm it's a great big advice. believer. <laughs> so, so people may look at me and say, well, how am I involved in so many things? The answer is because they're sequential. Mm -hmm, I went mm -hmm. from all in on business until I had literally learned everything I could possibly learn and made as big an impact in the world as my passions and interests would allow. And then when I moved to politics, it was all in on oh, politics. So, so even though I've done a lot, it's been, it's been in sequence where whatever I'm doing at that time is something that I am it is all consuming, it is the heart of my passion, and I am driving toward a specific outcome with everything I have and everything I've got and all the time and energy and the passion and the determination. And that's what gets things across the goal line. For sure, for sure. So speaking of your, your career in politics, so you're serving in the Mississippi House. I just would love to hear about what inspired you to get into politics in the first place. Sure, so I ran out of good business books to read. Um, I got <laughs> to the point of diminishing return where all the new business books I was reading sounded like all the ones I had already read. And so uh, somebody that was part of the, um, the state policy network, the SPN network of groups in the state of Mississippi that was working for the SPN think tank here in Mississippi, someone gave me a copy of a little primer called Governing by Principle put out by the Mississippi Center for Public Policy. And I read it and because I had time to read because I was getting you know, tired of business books that all sounded the same. And I read it and I got interested. I thought, well, this is interesting. I'd never thought about governing as being ruled by principles. I had never really thought about, you know, obviously government was there, but I was always too consumed with business to worry about what was happening other than sort of the headaches that government creates that you have to deal with in business. It was not something I thought about. So I started reading business books, sorry, political books after business books. And I got so consumed and so interested and so passionate that very early on in that process, within the first year or two, I came to the conclusion that the core to everything was liberty and freedom. Mm -hmm. And then it took an, an, an additional couple of years of study to get to the point where I felt like I understood the underlying economics of almost every political issue. And at that point, it became clear that if all I was going to do is show up and vote every two to four years, that I had wasted thousands of years in my life uh, researching all of these issues just to show up and vote for suboptimal candidates every two to four years. Mm -hmm. And so it became clear with that much knowledge in my head, if I wanted to make use of that knowledge, then I needed to be sitting in a chair where I could take a thousand votes a year, not one vote every two to four years for a candidate that inevitably would disappoint me. And uh, anyway, so I made the decision uh, 
a few years, I mean, like two or three years before I ran for office that I was going to. I did a massive amount of groundwork, laying the groundwork, putting everything in place. And the day I announced my candidacy, most of the world thought it was the first day it popped into my mind. The truth is two to three years of prep work had been done, laying the foundation, understanding the art of public policy and politics, the art of campaigning, how campaigns work, what it was going to take to win, building a donor network. And so I raised a record amount of money uh, for my house race. And we ran a robust, wildly successful campaign and won with 68% of the vote um, on, my, on my first race. And so, um, but yeah, but, but the interest was I ran out of good business books to read. And, and <laughs> you know, at this point, I'm starting to get to the point of diminishing return with reading about politics and public policy because I've I'm, I'm just very You'll well. You'll have to find the next thing, the next step. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So I'm going to stick with this as long as my interest will allow. But at, at some point, we'll see what the next thing is. But so far, I'm all in on politics, public policy, and the, and the future of liberty and freedom of the world. So for people like me who are on the outside of the political system, the political system itself and politics in general can be quite depressing. It just seems like things are very polarized. Uh, D.C. gets nothing done. A lot of state houses are no better. Um, now that you're actually in politics yourself, are you more or less optimistic than you were prior to entering politics? I, I am optimistic about specific issues uh, like medical marijuana, for example. I mean, drug policy reform, criminal justice reform, drug, uh, you know, medical marijuana policy, all of those things are moving in the direction of freedom and mm -hmm. irreversibly. So I like to work on what I call ratchet issues, which is an issue that if you win, it never goes back. So on November 3rd of this year, if Mississippi passes a medical marijuana program, they will never not have a medical marijuana program. It is a rat. It doesn't matter if Republicans or Democrats are in control. That issue is will be a settled issue, and, and, and so I, t I like to work on issues like that, that ratchet issues that if you win, you win permanently. I am, I am not, I guess I am not, um, I do not believe that all of our problems will be solved by, you know, that, that the political system in America is magically going to return to our founding. It is worth trying. It is worth winning for liberty. We can make the lives of thousands of people better every day with better public policy, more champions of liberty and freedom winning public office. It is, a, it is a, an incredible calling. Um, that being said, I'm also intensely interested in new models of human governance. So hmm. I am, I'm following very closely the charter cities movement. And I'm very, uh, very, I guess, plugged in and on the board of Prospera, which is a, uh, a uh, private economic development uh, on the island of Roatan in Honduras. Hmm. And so if you want to check it out, the website is prospera.hn. HN is Honduras. So prospera, P-R-O-S-P-E-R-A dot H-N. So to me, it's important that not only we, ad we uh, advance liberty and freedom where we are, but also that we are constantly testing the limits of new governance models and new things and new decentralization and Bitcoin, cryptocurrency. I think all of those things, we need to test all of those. So I am, I am very bullish, you know, meaning very optimistic for the future of the human race. I'm optimistic about the future of America. Um, but I also think that uh, on all fronts, again, whether drug policy or all these other things, we need to push the limits. Uh, you know, we need to push the limits of human governance. We need mm -hmm. to push the, the limits of ratchet issues. And, and ultimately, I think, um, I guess I'm, I'm a very optimistic person, but if somebody, if somebody says, you know, is, is politics about to turn into a panacea after the ele next election, I would say no. It is a constant crusade and fight for liberty and freedom, and it's a crusade that's worth having, but it's also a it's also, it is also worth exploring alternative governance models that, that sort of better privatize and better put mm -hmm, forward mm -hmm. uh, the, the principles of liberty and freedom. And, and to me, my, my research has, you know, has led to a lot of research on special economic zones, uh, charter mm -hmm. cities, uh, semi-autonomous economic zones, and, you know, Prospera on the island of Roatan in Honduras is, is currently the most exciting thing happening on those fronts. But uh, most of my time is spent right here in Mississippi fighting for liberty and freedom for, for the state of Mississippi and for the United States. So as a libertarian, right-of-center person myself, I just tend to think that the government 
uh, just kind of makes everything harder, gets in the way, and I want the government to generally get out of the way and just leave me alone. Uh, but now that you're in politics and you're effectively part of the government, how do you see your role? Do you, are you essentially just trying to use the power you have in politics to minimize the state's role in people's lives? Or do you think that there are certain places and, and issues where the government does have a role to fix problems and serve? I mean, wh what do you kind of see your role as? <laughs> so the government is generally bad at everything. And <laughs> the reason it's bad at everything is the incentives in government are almost always bad. So right. in the free market and the private sector, the incentives are generally to do whatever is the most economically beneficial or advantageous thing. In government, the incentives are almost always to do the wrong thing. And so some politicians stand up to those incentives and do the right things anyway, even though the incentives are to do the wrong things. But in general, people follow incentives, which means in general, government will be getting in people's way, doing the wrong things, doing very incompetently anything that it's involved in. And so, yeah, I view my role in government to lessen the harms of government to the greatest degree I can. Hmm. And I've been able to do that in a lot of ways with criminal justice reform, foster care reform, and you know, working on, on issues like medical marijuana where people are incarcerated today for using a plant that God made, which makes no sense. Um, and so, but I, but I think, yeah, inside, I mean, if, if you ever find me advocating in favor of you know, some, some function of government, it's only because the way the government is currently doing it is far worse. And it is never because I think the government's going to do, you know, a great job of this or that or the other. Um, so to, to the degree there is a role for government at all in a central coercive monopoly fashion. And I know that's, you know, de deeply debated whether government should even serve that purpose. But if, if, it, if you admit that there is a place for government at all, it, should, it would and should only be to protect life, liberty, and property rights. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And so almost everything we do in the Mississippi House of Representatives is beyond the boundaries of, a, of that legitimate goal, role of government. It's, it's programs around healthcare and education and all this sort of stuff that was never envisioned right. in the Constitution is not a core function of government because government's role, again, is protecting life, liberty, and property rights. And that does not put government in 95% of all of the things government in Mississippi does. So, so yeah, I, I, I'm in government to make government less worse. I've never voted for anything that makes government worse, at least not consciously. I've, I've got the closest thing possible to an absolutely pure, you know, liberty, freedom voting record on every single issue. And where possible means privatize everything, get the government out of everything. And where the government, where you can't get the government out at least mute the harms, mm -hmm. lessen the harms, sort of defang the beast. And if I can defang the beast somehow, then I'm going to do that in every way I can, uh, even if I can't sort of eliminate the government's role entirely from whatever it is. So can you name maybe two or three people uh, in Washington, D.C. in politics who you look up to? And can you just tell me what your your plans are, your plans are for your political future? I mean, do you want to be in the Senate someday? What the White House? What are your what are your goals? Good question. So my wife and I have been married 19 years and have four kids. And I believe that the constituents that are the most important are the ones that live in my house. <laughs> and so whether, whether I serve in the House of Representatives or statewide office in Mississippi or in Washington, all of those jobs involve serving a constituency. And the constituency I care most about and am most responsible for is my wife and my four kids. And so we have a great thing going in Mississippi, so I am not planning to go to Washington you know, soon. Um, regardless of the, the degree to which the swamp may need me, um, I, it would not be good for my wife or my family. I'm not going to commute to Washington. That's a marriage killer and a family killer. And I'm not going to move them up there right now either. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in the near term, I'll be focused on advancing liberty in the state of Mississippi at whatever level God calls me to. Um, I also believe in being prepared. So I don't run for political offices I can't win. Mm -hmm. And so if, if I run for a political office, you can be sure that I have done the work. I have laid the groundwork. And that I have a high probability of winning. Otherwise, I don't take you know political long shots. Um, if anything worth worth winning is worth preparing for. So, so my plan is yeah, long term, 
uh, I guess I, I'm not super specific other than I'm in the fight for liberty and freedom long term. Uh, it still animates me and gets me excited and passionate. And there's a lot of issues I care about, again, like medical marijuana and other things that I'm in it for the long haul. And uh, anyway, so we'll, we'll see where that goes. But uh, liberty and freedom are the values worth fighting for. And in whatever capacity, I'll be fighting a long time. And in the near term, that will be in the state of Mississippi, where I can serve my wife and my family best and where I'm only a 20 minute drive from the Capitol, which is uh, <laughs> works great for me. I'm home for dinner every night. Love it, love it. So just quickly give me your top issue that you are looking at right now. I mean, what do you think is the issue that doesn't get enough attention ahead of the next election that people should be paying attention to? Sure, so I mean, there's a lot of national issues. Uh, I, I like, uh, there's an article online where Stefan Kinsella uh, lays out what he believes are, I think he calls it the, gr the, the, uh, the greatest state evils. And he goes through and he says, uh, you know, it's an interventionist foreign policy and it's uh, the fiat currency in the Federal Reserve and it's, you know, government schools and it's uh, uh, drug policy and intellectual property law and taxation. Mm -hmm. And I would throw some other things in there like uh, I'm pro-life, so I would throw mm -hmm. that in there, mm -hmm. immigration policy, trade policy. So I think with all the ones I mentioned, which gets you up to, you know, nine or 10, <laughs> I would say my focus is what I can influence at a state level. What I can influence at a state level are things like medical marijuana policy mm -hmm. and education policy. A lot of those other issues are federal. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in free trade. I think we ought to have free trade. I'm disappointed that, you know, that things are not where they need to be on, on the trade front. Um, I'm pro-immigration. I believe immigration is a good mm -hmm. thing when done right. I'm I'm disappointed with the current sort of federal approach to immigration. Uh, I think we need more people, but but I don't know, as far as big issues, again, I'm so consumed right now with the medical marijuana campaign in Mississippi and sort of cannabis reform efforts, mm -hmm. specifically around medical marijuana nationwide. That I just think, I think that's a, it's a great issue uh, along with criminal justice reform. It's a great issue that's bipartisan. And it's one of the few things that we all ought to be able to get on the same page about. It's Absolutely. not inherently, zero sum. It's not inherently ideologically op opposed. And so I guess I'm focused on a ratchet issues that are not going to get undone on the next election and B things that we can all come together on and, and then things I can influence at a state level versus a federal level. Um, so that, I guess that's, that's a few thoughts on that. No, that's great. And I think if we can focus on those issues that we can come together on, perhaps it'll sort of break up the polarization and that's when we can start to see some real progress. Okay, so last question for you, Joel. We ask every guest this. If you could have dinner with one person uh, who has the exact opposite political views as you, who would you choose and why? Oh, man. Well, there's a lot of people who have the exact opposite views of me, <laughs> probably Bernie Sanders. You know, Bernie Sanders, although I would say on a few issues, you know, like, you know, maybe foreign policy, he's not so bad. But, um, but I don't know that I would actually, again, if opposite of me. Or close to opposite, close to or opposite. close to opposite. I don't know. I, don't, I will say this. Um, I think there's a high value in building dialogue with people that disagree with you. I think it's sure. it. It humanizes the opposition, and there's a lot of people I team up with that it's easy to team up with um, on issues you care about. So you don't have to talk about the issues you don't care about. You can be doing the same issue for different reasons. It doesn't matter. I'll team up with anybody that wants to advance the ball on things that involve liberty and freedom and issues I care about. Um, and as far as uh, you know, as far as who's I, who I'd have dinner with. I don't know. There's a bunch of people that are ideologically similar to me that I'd love to have dinner with. Some, some of which are have you know have passed away in past decades that I would love to pick their brain. You know, I've read every book they've ever written, and I'd love to pick their brain on a couple last unanswered questions, but they're not here to answer them anymore. But, uh, but anyway, so uh, but I don't know. I, mo most of what's, what's worth knowing is written down. So I guess rather than uh, rather than have dinner with somebody if they've written a book, I'll just go read the book. <laughs> probably. There you I'm go. Probably gonna look from an eight-hour book that I am from a two-hour day. <laughs> Great answer. I love it. Well, uh, we've been talking to Joel Baumgar. He's a state representative in the Mississippi House of Representatives. Joel, can you just quickly tell our listeners and viewers how to find you online? Yeah, so uh, you can reach me. My website is joelbaumgar.com, J-O-E-L-B-O-M-G-A-R.com. Facebook, Twitter, the same. Uh, my cell phone number, which is all over the internet, is 601-573-4198. So 
this iPhone that I keep in my pocket is always on me. And that, that iPhone number, you can call me, text me 601-573-4198. Um, and, or email me at joel at joelbomgar.com. Uh, so I have one, one cell phone number, uh, the, the number online on my website forwards directly to my personal cell. It just screens out robocalls, but other than that, it forwards directly to my personal cell. And so I have one, one cell phone number and one email address. And, uh, I pride myself in being highly available. If somebody has something, you know, meaningful they need, I am here to serve. Love it. Well, thank you so much, Joel. We really appreciate your time. And uh, thanks for joining. You built that. Thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm here to serve. Thank you.